um, we were getting these kind of like herbs and flowers and things like that from somewhere in Seattle. And uh, okay, no, yeah, and so they were getting, the they were getting, yeah, <laughs> no, they were fresh. Um, but one day the delivery came and it wasn't the freshest. Mm. And so we were looking at it and I was just like, Chef, I know where I can get better and nicer things. And basically that's how I became a forager. Okay. Yeah. You self-taught, right? Self-taught. Um, like, so what year was that? Because, you know, like recently there are tons of little different food movements. Um, 10 years ago, was it almost 10 years ago, it was the molecular gastronomy. Then right afterwards was where, where um, René was that piece sort of come and rise in power. And then it, it was probably around that time. That, it, um, it was probably like 2000, end of 2009, 2010. Okay. So kind of around that, around that time where uh, Noma was starting to make like the top three, I think, around there and maybe like number one in the world. Um, other restaurants in the Bay Area were doing foraging, like a Qua, which is a I think at the time a two star, yeah. um, the chef would be going out and foraging and stuff like that. Daniel so, Patterson, right? Exactly, Daniel Patterson. Um, so it would be basically just around the same time. Yeah. So foraging is interesting in that um, there's so many different plants and herbs around the world. So it's quite specific to your region. Um, there's going to be things that you can eat here that might not be that look the same here, but might be poisonous. It's pretty pretty funny how that works out. Um, so you do have to be careful about certain things, but generally, if you just stick to, you know, what you saw in the market, you'll, you'll go okay. So when I first started, I was like picking like maybe two or three items. Um, so I'd forage nasturtiums, um, miner's lettuce, which is a type of, um, it's basically a type of wild green, chickweed, stuff like that. And I bought all these books and I just kept looking at them and I would see like, okay, there's that plant. I'm going to look out for that next time. If I see it, I'll be like, okay, great. I'll taste it. Uh, if it tastes good and tastes right, then this bird might want to bring it back. And you're still alive? Most and, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, if it tastes bad, I'll be like, okay, maybe I'll go back and research a little bit more. And a lot of times when I tasted it and I taste bad and I spit it out, I would go back and research and it'd be like a lookalike plant that mm -hmm. wasn't edible. Some plants look so similar, but then like the books will tell you one or two defining characteristics that, mm -hmm. will, that you will be able to tell the difference. So like chickweed is a very, like, it's a cute green. It's like, like pretty easily recognizable. Um, but I did find out that there was a lookalike. So one day I picked a lookalike and I was like, that looks funny, that doesn't look right. So I tasted it and it tasted like shit, absolute bitter. And mm. it, it basically tasted toxic. So I went and looked at it and I was like, okay. So I looked at it and I went back and researched it and it turned out to be a plant called Scarlet Pimpernel, which is not edible. And then so I found is out- Is it poisonous though? Uh, I believe it's slightly toxic, yes. Okay. Yeah. He's immune to it by the I'm not immune to it. I spit so, it out for sure. So I think, I think this is interesting. Because okay? yeah. um, human beings, we, we sort of lost in touch with nature already. But Maybe we have, yes. Yeah, most of us. Most <laughs> yeah. of us, right? Yeah. Um, but our body, like... Still recognize Still recognize what's poisonous and what's not poisonous. Anything bitter, it's just... Nah, it's not bitter. Yeah, it's a, it's a built-in mechanism. If it's bitter, it's probably bad for you to spit it out. So what was a day, a, a day like when you were foraging? So foraging is very tiring because um, I was doing foraging on top of my actual duties in the restaurant. Um, and so I would get up early. Uh, I would wake up probably about like 6.30 and then I would shower up, get dressed, get all my stuff. And then I'll take the bus to my spot, which probably took about 45 minutes. And I'll do like a two hour hike. Um, hike around and I have my little spot so I actually knew I knew where to go for my things um, it's like going it's like your fridge you're like oh you know where everything is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go and pick this pick fridge <laughs> yeah and um, go and pick and then also it depends on the season as well so yeah. I, I knew kind of like where things were mm. I'd go around and do my loop and pa pick stuff and then come back and then take the bus back to the restaurant which is even longer than 45 minutes can't, like, like an hour um, take a back, bus back to the restaurant and then start serve it, uh, start my prep, and then do service, breakdown, and then... Um, that's, doing, that's, doing at least, <laughs> that's at least 15 hours a day, it <laughs> sounds like. Uh, just a little bit more. Um, moving forward, like, um, there's a lot of talks and trends, I mean, development in terms of food in the coming future. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the by 2050, we expect to add another four billion people in town. Really? In on our the yeah. town that I'm talking about. I was gonna say that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what is what is your opinion on you know lab meat versus your experience, your deep experience with foraging? Um, how do you see this trend play, and how should chef even respond? Um, so I have two minds of it. So in a sense, yes, it'd be nice. It's great that we want to get more in touch with our food. We want to have the traceability, sustainability, um, and we can pick what we want to eat. Um, but us sitting at this table, and anyone who's watching this, um, who has the ability to choose what they want to eat on a daily basis, is basically in the top 1% of people in, that have ever existed in this world. Like, you're living the good life. Mm. For most of humankind, we had to eat what was available to us. And I think with the growing population, that's going to become even more so. Um, so I, I believe there's going to be more of a separation between um, what is available to most people and then what people can, who have the means to afford it, can eat. Yeah. So I think um, for the majority of the population, yes, there are going to be so many more mouths to feed. Lab-grown meat is probably going to be the best way to get uh, affordable protein to them. Yeah. I think lab-grown meat is actually um, fantastic. It's, yeah, it's just, you, we raise cows for meat, but they are basically, uh, you grow the cow just for a few things. How should chef respond to this? How should chefs respond to this? Um, I'm a realist. If I want to continue doing this kind of food, um, I have to make that judgment call. So it's like, I'm going to continue doing this and then take this in this direction. Um, if you're going to be doing scalable food and like food for the multitude, you've got to have a completely different mindset. I see. Yeah, it's got to be definitely more you, industrial. You pick your path. You pick your path. Like, um, yeah. People have given industrial agriculture a bad rep. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they're not great for the planet, and yes, um, they're not great for the animals, and yes, they pump a lot of antibiotics and things in the food that we don't necessarily want to eat. But what they have brought to the table is feeding so many more people with mm. more calories. What do you see um, what Chipotle does, right? So on one hand, they're doing sort of like upscale fast food. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they are trying their all their best to say, uh, not try to serve you anything, uh, the chicken with antibiotics and sort of, so they do. What's, what's your view on that? I think it's great. Um, but we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna ask for a dollar more, at least. Yeah, I think US people, dollar, not the Hong Kong dollar. <laughs> yeah, I think people are um, a bit separated for what the true cost of food is actually. Like, especially in Singapore, where food is very cheap is because um, a lot of the, the rental for the hawker centers have been subsidized. Um, it's kind of been artificially depressed, so that people have unrealistic expectations of what it takes to get food to your plate. Start from a pot of land that somebody has to pay for, seed that someone has to pay for, fuel, water, everything that, you know, all these costs that go into it to be prepared, to coming to you. Um, food should definitely be more expensive. Um, We've done a good job in the past, probably like 100, 150 years, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, of getting more food to more people. Mm. Um, but I think it'll probably come back to us if we don't have another, like, a breakthrough in food technology, like lab grown meat. Yep. Um, it'll come back to us. So, are you, are you talking about because of the land itself or? No, because the of the cost like, of, of raising plants? Or? Well, what do, what do you mean? Because let's say um, farmers take cost a lot of money mm -hmm. nowadays, a lot of machinery, yeah. and then the land is getting well. You, Scarcer, you, yeah. you, you know, you cannot get earth bigger, right? Yeah. So people are trying to get all the lands and build it whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Was it because of that makes the food more expensive? Um, I think it's a combination. Yeah, a combination of probably factors is um, land scarcity of resources and demand. That which leads to that question. So, what do you think about vertical farming? Like, I, I mean, literally vertical farming. It's like, 
So someone were proposing, uh, I, I think even they, they're doing it in, in, uh, in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And someone Singapore. is trying to do it in yeah, Singapore. Uh, Lots in Singapore. Singapore yeah. in a, not necessarily an industrial building, but they're trying to make um, farming within high rise. I think it's great. Um, the idea is great. The execution, I mean, I think it's a, like, again, it's a cost thing. Um, if you're growing lettuce, how much can you sell the lettuce for? And does it pay for your building that you have to build up and, you know, pump the water up and, you know, machinery and stuff? Are you able to recoup your investment? It's a business. Hmm. You have to think about it as a business aspect. Are you able to do that? Also, you got to think about where the calories are coming from. Again, it's a calorie game. Um, are you growing lettuce and herbs? That's, that's fine. But how much lettuce can a guy eat? Like, how much lettuce does a person need to get the calories that they need? They're going to be chewing all day. So, like, they're going to be like a cow. It's chewing all day. <laughs> so, like, we have to be realistic about where we focus our energy. Mm -hmm. I think some of these, like, these things are good as supplements, but you have to get down to the, where do people get their calories from. It's like rice. Can you farm rice vertically? Potatoes, can you farm potatoes vertically? I think potatoes are going to be easier than, <laughs> than rice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like rice is a staple yeah. for billions of people. Exactly. You know, so how are you going to do that? So I think we have to, you know, I mean, it's good. It's because I'm not negating like all the work that's being done. I just think we have to be very smart about um, where we focus our energy and resources. Um, do you think like Asia market or Asian Southeast Asian is ready to go this way? I mean, there's obviously a lot of investment happening in terms of vertical farming, alternative food development, alternative food meat, but do people actually understand or would they buy in? Would we actually move that way? Um, I think it just comes down to cost. If it's if mm -hmm. it's if people are able to see the value in it and it it meets their budget, then yes. I mean, it's great to say like oh, I'm gonna do these beautiful organic hydroponic lettuces and stuff like that, but if it they cost like a hundred dollars a pound, no one's gonna buy them. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I'm be, maybe I'm being pessimistic, but I think it's it, very realistic. Yeah, as well. you, you got to be realistic. It's like, yeah. it's a it's a food industry. It's a business. Someone for someone to produce something, they have to get something back. And if they're not going to recoup their investment, they're not going to. It's not going to be worth it for them. And even worse is it because food is usually have a really low margin. Yeah, food is a terrible <laughs> margin. Exactly. <laughs> like in, in terms of, yeah. we know we everybody knows retail has a really bad margin, mm -hmm. and on the bottom is food industry. <laughs> like the worst of the worst in terms of yeah. retail business. I think um, it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier where it's like we are lucky to be able to choose at this point in our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. like we can choose what we want to eat on a daily basis and we are able to afford that. How many people in the previous span of humankind were someone able to go out and like, I want to eat this today, I want to eat that today? You know, starvation was a, like a fact of life basically. Yeah. And um, we have to realize that. And you know what? It's not even... It, starvation is a fact of life for people right now. So unless we're able to address that with these vertical farming stuff like that, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, mm. who are the people that need to be helped the most? Mm. Yeah. Do we, need, do we need hydroponic lettuce? I don't think we need hydroponic lettuce. Do you have ever, ever feel a, have a feeling of burnt out? Yeah, I think being burnt out is a real feeling. Um, I got kind of burnt out after foraging and cooking at the same time. Um, but that was only part of the reason. Um, I think one of the other reasons was I felt that there was more aspects to the restaurant game. Um, a restaurant isn't just about the food. In the start of my career, I was just like, I'm gonna focus on the food. I just care about making good food. I just wanna learn about food. I don't care about anything else. Um, but a restaurant's a business. Like anything else, it's a business. Um, so if you don't, if you make really good food, but you don't understand the business, well, you're not gonna have a business for very long. You know what I mean? So I realized, especially after working at Cezanne, where they built it from a pop-up to now a three-star restaurant, um, uh, I realized that there was something more to it. Like, what's the magic behind it, and how did they do that? So I tried to reverse engineer. I went back to school and tried to think about it. And um, it's good, it's good to understand more facets to the restaurant. Um, so I went back to school. I got a marketing degree, and um, yeah. But then, kind of the food industry drew me back in. So I opened my own restaurant in Singapore. But but yeah. a quick question before asking your your, your restaurant in Singapore. Mm. Do you feel, was it the right timing that, that you did not have the, the degree in San Francisco, but in Singapore, because you become more mature or? Um, so I had a degree in culinary, culinary arts. Yeah. yeah. So associate's degree in culinary arts. 
Um, but I think... But the original plan for your parents is that you're going to get a degree first. Get a degree. So I, I kind of did it for myself as, as well. So I, I think it's one of those things. Uh, I was a little bit more mature and I could kind of buckle down and study and you know, I got the partying out of my system. Um, so I could actually spend time to do what I focus on that. And yeah, it was good because um, it's kind of like the self-actualization kind of thing where you want to like, I want to make sure that I have this. And no one can ever say like, oh, you didn't, you don't have a degree. Because I think, especially in Asia, it's a very paper-driven society. Yeah. Like, if you don't have a degree, then people are like, oh, well, you don't have a degree, so do you actually know what you're talking about? It's like, you could have 30, 40 years of experience, and there's still question, but you don't have a degree, you know? It's very frustrating. That's, I'm sure it's very frustrating, <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I, didn't wanna, I didn't want that hanging over my head. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah sure. So, to, in this... Um, and like most of the interviews, we actually have a lightning round. So we're going to have um, really quick questions. You can think of it more than two seconds. Bonnie going to ask you some questions, random ones. Okay. You just, just right away answer it. Is, would you be a chef again or never? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, Korean fried chicken or poke bowl? Poke. <laughs> Yeah. Um, lab meat or vegan? Lab meat. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a look at my size. <laughs> um, traditional food or fusion? Ooh. There's no such thing as traditional, I don't think. No. Yeah. Fair point. Uh, local produce or imported food? Depends what, what you're trying to do. Female chef or male chef? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. So. Okay, well, actually, actually, you know, to yeah. that question. Yep. Yeah. Um, I feel that male chefs have more ego. We definitely have more ego. So we cook for ourselves and try to impress people with our skills and technique and whatever. Um, I feel that, I'm being very generous here, mm -hmm. but I feel that um, women who cook are coming from a more, not, not pleasing background, but they are trying to make you happy as opposed to stroke their own ego. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like they're cooking. They're cooking for <laughs> yeah. They're cooking for you rather than mm. I'm cooking to show you what I got. I think one. Of, okay, so I was ha in my mind. I think one of the biggest compliments that anyone could ever give uh, a chef or a cook is saying you cook like a grandma. Oh. Yeah, okay. that's like that was something that I always tried to strive for. It's like if someone tastes my food, be like, oh man, you cook like a grandma. I'd be like, I made it. Yeah, so that would be like something that I would always try, try to strive for. Um, yeah. So finally, with as a takeaway, what would you um, advise on people who are aspiring to be chef today? Um, um, if you're aspiring to be a chef and you're not a chef yet, go work in a kitchen first. Go work for a month, two months, three months, six mm -hmm. months. See if it's for you. If, if you can hack it for six months, um, pursue it. And if you don't like it, You'll, well, you'll find out if you don't like it. You'll find yeah. out fast. Yeah, you'll learn fast. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, you very yeah, much. That was really lovely. lovely. Thank you so oh, yeah. much. There's more, there's more for you guys. I gotta keep it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank, thank you, you. so much. Thank you. Yeah. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and sign up to our newsletter at hungryhugger.com.